Okay, well, thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, today's presentation is jam-packed with information, subject matter experts, and a lot and a lot of information. So I, I really do appreciate everybody uh, attending. And because we have such a large crowd and, and hunger for information, we do have a, a couple members of our leadership that would like to give opening remarks. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I apologize for being a little bit late. Um, technical errors, I feel, is the excuse of uh, the year. Um, but anyway, welcome to everybody uh, to today's Client Enrichment Series presentation. Uh, our customers are the heart of our business, and we look forward to continuing to partnering with you to meet your unique missions and goals. My name is Nina Albert, and I'm the Commissioner of the Public Building Service. I'm excited to introduce the ABCs of PBS. Before I turn things over to our host, James, I wanna take a moment to thank you all for attending. Today, you will hear a high level overview of how the Public Building Service works and the roles of our individual business lines. As someone who is fairly new to PBS myself, I've been here for just over 100 days. I know that our organization can feel complex. This presentation provides a high level overview and has something for everyone, whether you are also new to working with PBS or if you're just learning to learn more about our organization. After today's presentation, I encourage each of you to visit www.gsa.gov forward slash CES to learn more about the virtual training that PBS offers and to view past presentations on our YouTube channel. We have more than 30 archived presentations on topics ranging from pricing to leasing to reimbursable services. Once again, thank you for joining us today. And now I'd like to turn things over back to James. James, take it away. Thanks, Nina. Thanks for thanks for attending our presentation today. Appreciate it. So my name is is James Fatopoulos. I'm a member of GSA's Client Enrichment ser uh, Series, serving out of Kansas City, so home of the Chiefs. I'll be serving as your host and presenter today. Before we begin, I want to let everyone know here that we are recording today's session. We post archived Client Enrichment Series videos on our YouTube channel. You can access more than 30 past sessions anytime, day or night. There is a link to our YouTube channel at the end of today's slide deck. Before we get into the material of today's presentation, a few housekeeping instructions. We have automatically muted your audio to help us control the sound quality of the presentation. If you are new to using Zoom, welcome. We have found the Zoom for Government platform to be pretty intuitive and user-friendly. You can customize your view with different pods as you see fit. Speaking of, you will see there is a chat pod as well as a Q&A area. For this session, please use the chat pod for any administrative logistical questions you have or to report any issues you're experiencing and one of our CES team members can assist you. This presentation will cover a lot of ground and a high level inf informational overviews. We ask that any questions relevant today to today's material be posted in the Q&A pod. At the end of each individual session, we will address a few brief questions and the remainder will be answered at the end of the presentation as a whole. For those participating by telephone only today and following along with the slide deck, you too can participate in the Q&A. Please email your questions and comments to us via our mailbox at clientrichmentseries at gsa.gov and we'll make sure to add them to our questions list. Any questions we're unable to get to today will be noted and questions will be answered and posted on our website at www.gsa.gov slash CES. Closed captioning is available for today's questions or, or sessions instructions were sent out with the slide decks and we'll post a link to service to that service in the chat pane. Open that link and you'll view the caption side, you'll view the caption side by side with your Zoom screen. Today's presentation will be led by a number of presenters I will be taking the GSA overview today and we'll be providing uh, questions about or providing an overview over GSA operations. A little bit about myself, in case you're wondering, I am a regional account manager, also a regional planning manager. 
and I do assist my customers develop strategic requirements for, leashes, for leases, and I have over 14 years of experience. That means I've been at GSA probably half as long as some of our SMEs today who have way vast uh, knowledge than, than I have. So I appreciate all of our presenters today. So, as I said, we're going to start with our GSA overview, give you a, a little bit of a flavor of the agency that we are. So, you'll see here our mission is to deliver value and savings in real estate acquisition technology and other mission support services across the government. Our values include service, accountability, and innovation. GSA was created in 1949 after the passage of the Federal Property and Administrative Service Act during the Truman Administration. In 2019, this marked our agency's 70th anniversary. As you see on the slide, you'll see our mission and values as I just spoke. And keep in mind, we also keep that taxpayer as our key stakeholder. As far as the agency funding is concerned, only 1% of GSA's total budget is provided through direct congressional appropriations. Majority of GSA's operating costs are recovered through the products and services it provides. GSA leads the way in sustainable buildings, design, construction, retrofit, and sustainable operations and maintenance. GSA's focus is building a 21st century government that procures and manages technology, solutions in smart, secure, and affordable ways. We also support reductions in federal government, real estate costs, and increases in workplace efficiencies by strategically integrating space people and technology solutions. And here is our uh, overall work chart. GSA is led by a pres presidential appointed administrator that oversees the agency staff offices, services, and regions. GSA has two sub-agencies within its organization, the Federal Acquisition Service, otherwise known as FAS, and the, P and the Public Building Service, also known as PBS. Independent offices include the Office of Inspector General and Civilian Board of Contract Appeals. A little bit about our sister service FAST. They leverage the buying power of the federal government to acquire the best value for taxpayers and federal customers. Areas of focus include products and services, technology, motor vehicle management, transportation, travel, procurement, and online acquisition tools. FAST helps our federal Federal customers procure equipment, IT, furniture, and supplies they need to support their staff. We often work hand in hand with our sister service to provide a real turnkey solution for federal work, uh, workplaces and its employees. So, today's focus the Public Building Service serves civilian federal agencies who use our programs to provide their workplace and furnishings at the best value of the American taxpayer. Areas of focus include promotion of innovative workplace solutions, acting as green technology proving ground, support development of urban communities, provide space for child care centers, and donates or sells underutilized real estate, and the list goes on and on of what we're involved with. So you met Nina Albert earlier uh, in the opening remarks, and this is the org chart where she appears. We are organized in 11 regions. So there's a map to the right there that shows our regions. I am out of region six called the Heartland region. And um, they're listed to the left there are, are our regional commissioners. Under the PBS commissioner, Nina Albert is her deputy, Allison Azevedo, Jeremiah Jones of the Office of Strategy and Engagement and David Fry, Office of Chief of Staff. GSA is a real estate heavyweight boasting a portfolio of over 8,000 total assets spanning over 300 million in renewable square footage and serving nearly a million federal customers in our federal lease buildings. We keep our workforce very, very busy. And speaking of our workforce, here's a list of the folks that help us with our mission within GSA, the people behind our success as an agency. From project managers to contracting officers to facility managers, GSA has the federal government covered. So, what do our successes look like? Looking at the first image to the right in our Salt Lake region, our Rocky Mountain region, 
GSA consolidated two leases to federal space and reduced the agency footprint by 52%, a taxpayer savings of 1.5 million in annual rent. The second image to the right describes GSA exercising the purchase option contained in its current lease for the U.S. Department of Transportation headquarters at 1200 New Jersey Avenue in the Federal Center neighborhood. The purchase puts DOT's headquarters in federally owned space, making the, the final making this the final cabinet level agency to move its headquarters from lease space to own space. The move from lease to federal space will have a taxpayer savings of over $409 million over 30 years. And during the presentation, you'll see this pattern. We have a list of resources for each section that's listed there from our website to our org chart and even a YouTube video is listed there for to commemorate our 70th anniversary. So if you're interested in more history about the, about the agency, I would click on a YouTube um, video listed there. So the real estate journey. Now that you've learned a little bit about our mission and goals and organization, let's focus on how GSA partners with its customers, you on the phone, by taking you on this real estate journey. And this is a roadmap that we'll use throughout the presentation. So keep this, keep this slide in mind. The slide denotes the journey we'll take on today for the rest of the session. First, we'll stop and talk about strategic planning, your occupancy, before you put pen to paper. Think about what your own customers need to complete their missions. From there, we'll move to budgeting for your space, procuring, build out of space, and then occupying it. Once you've occupied your space for some time, we know things change. You've hired more folks, and now you need to alter your space. And as the, even more time goes by, the mission changes, budgets change, and resources now have to be real, reallocated. Now you need to dispose of some of your real estate space and possibly release it. We'll talk about that too. So keep in mind, when you go through the real estate journey, you may make a U-turn, you may merge off the highway, you may, may, you may merge back on during your projects with GSA. And with that, our next speaker is Tazneen Barberwall. She is a national planning manager with the PBS Office of Portfolio Management and Customer Solutions to walk us through our first stop. Tazneen has over 20 years of experience at GSA. She has extensive experience in both asset management, account management, and serving regional roles in both programs. In 2015, she joined PBS Central Office as National Program Manager for Customer Planning. In this role, she set up the PBS Occupancy Planning Protocols, emphasizing early customer engagement and partnership when it comes to developing space strategies. Tazneen, take it away. All right, thanks, James. I appreciate that. Um, again, my name is Tisney Babarwala, I'm the National Planning Program Manager um, out of our headquarters in DC. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And so, like James said, you know, we, we do a lot of, um, of, of planning, right? Um, I think you all with your customers and then us here in PBS, um, as he showed you the roadmap, that's really the first step um, when we're trying to figure out, you know, what does our footprint need to look like um, going forward? Um, I think what we can all agree on, right? Why do we strategically plan? Well, first of all, real estate changes take a lot of time. Uh, what we found out you know, through our analysis over the last 10 to 15 years is when we're looking at even just the lease scenario, um, it usually takes us about 24 months to, to execute our lease. That means before requirements are even given to us, just the execution itself, meaning once we put an RLP together, we go on the street and we actually go ahead and award a lease to when we do build out, <clears throat> it can take up to 24. Um, that can obviously change based on complexity of a project. But again, knowing that the execution can take that long, we know we need even more time to plan and make sure that whatever we're going to execute really meets our long-term needs. Um, <clears throat> what we've also found in the last 10 to 15 years is engaging you all um, too close to that execution um, timeframe is really not a benefit to you as our customer nor to ourselves. Um, just like James has showed you, there's a lot of folks that we have in GSA um, to really make sure that we're putting the right um, information forward to you all uh, when it comes to planning for occupancies. And so obviously, you know, we wanna meet your mission needs um, and we wanna meet your operational needs, but there's a lot of information that needs to come into play around the market, 
um, and around even your current location. And again, you know, any changes that are occurring with your operations, um, we wanna make sure that we have enough time to have those discussions with you. Um, we wanna make sure we have enough time to, um, you know, ensure that if there are any barriers to you coming and collaborating with us, that we have enough time to, to bring solutions to the table. And just like James said, we have a lot of folks behind the scenes that would help us do that. Um, the, other, um, the, the other piece that we've really come across in the last 10 to 15 years is you have seen that a business model that allows for perpetual short-term solutions really doesn't work for anyone in the government, right? Um, when we do extensions, it's usually just kicking the can forward on the space needs. Um, and it's a recurring uh, resource allocation, right? Because those spaces need to be talked about, they need to be collaborated upon, that workload doesn't ever go away. And when we do short-term fixes, <clears throat> there is a cost to it. Um, there's a cost to A because every time we talk about it, there's a resource that comes to it. Um, but then also <clears throat> the short-term solutions usually have a cost factor in the rental rate um, that's agreed to with the lessor. Of course, on our federal side, we have a little bit more flexibility, um, <clears throat> but we talk really, when we're talking about strategically planning, we start with our lease scenarios just because that is where the government has the most risk. Um, and what you'll see as we kind of go through some of the expectations around the timeline, we use our lease um, inventory is kind of the indicator and the baseline, but then our federal inventory really does follow suit, <clears throat> although in some cases it may um, shift just a little bit, but I'll talk about that uh, in a couple seconds. Next slide. So, you know, along with GSA doing a lot of analysis, <clears throat> outside of GSA, there's obviously um, a lot of analysis that's going on um, at the higher levels of government. Um, we've seen in the last 10 years a huge shift in how we look at space, right? It started in 2012 um, when we had freeze the footprint, um, morphed into 2015 where it said, okay, we need more efficient use of our real estate. Um, and then we went to reducing the footprint. Um, the GAO has done multiple reports on how space is utilized and how it's planned for. Um, and then just recently, <clears throat> we have the return to federal workplace plans. Um, and this is where you all really kind of come into this, right? Because obviously, with everything that's gone on for the last two years, we're seeing a huge shift in how we look at space, even, even much more so than we have in the last 10 years. Um, and so there, there's a lot to work out. There's a lot of unknowns. And, and we'll get into some of that a little bit later. Um, so what's the point, right, of making sure that we're looking at our space collectively, not just GSA, but you all in the, on the customer side as well? The goal is, right, we want to reduce the cost of real estate. Real estate is expensive, and when we have underutilized space, it really doesn't make sense for money to go towards space instead of operations and mission needs. Um, and then again, more efficient space, um, modernized space really also is what kind of the new generation of our workforce is looking for, right? Um, people today are working different than they did 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and again, you know, with, with new work workforce coming into the federal government, we wanna make sure that we're meeting their needs, um, whether it's, you know, through technology um, or through more collaborative types of spaces. Uh, next slide. So what you see here is our project life cycle. And what you'll hear today during our presentation is bits and pieces of this project life cycle. Um, but my conversation is really today kind of uh, focused on the identification and then initiation and planning. Um, mostly on identification, because that's really our first um, engagement with you. And it's really important because it really does set the tone for the rest of that project life cycle. If we get delayed in those first three brackets, it has a huge effect on the execution, which then of course affects your occupancy date and causes all sorts of problems, not only financially, but also logistically. Next slide. All right, so what is this project identification phase, right? And why, why do we say that's probably one of the most important pieces when we're coming to talk to you? Um, like I said before, it really kind of sets the tone for the occupancy. Um, and the reason it's important is because of timing. The timing is that we're coming to you much earlier than we ever have in the past. Um, it's, it's there to ensure that we have the right analysis. And that means analysis on the PBS side, um, and then analysis that we can share with you all when we're making this deci decision on what your occupancy can look like. Um, so the second bullet point where it says collaboration across PBS business lines, just to you know, make sure you all understand, 
before we even engage with you, GSA is really looking at our inventory holistically um, at a five to four year period before an occupancy is expiring. The point of doing that is to make All right. I think we Business lost. Lines. Oh, there we go. Oh, sorry. Sorry. We guys. lost you for a second. All right. Internet issues. Um, sorry about that. So I just want to make sure. So so this this piece about promoting collaboration across business lines, it's really important because Again, you know, we want to be a trusted partner to you all as our customers. We want to make sure we're bringing information that's pertinent to ensuring that the occupancy that you then end up moving forward with really meets your needs, but also is looking into the future and takes into consideration, you know, ways that we can can help you either reduce your footprint, um, you know, create uh, collaborative spaces like we said before, um, and again make sure that we're not going into occupancies that we're gonna to have to have major changes to in five years. Um, we wanna make sure that we are bringing the right information, right, early to you all. Um, the type of information that we, we then end up coming to you to agree upon is what we have listed before, below. Um, you know, the usable square footage, the occupancy count, um, use of, of, of the space in general, and then any go, no go criteria. But again, this is all very much facilitated. So how are we facilitating this conversation? Next slide. Oh, sorry. Well, before I tell you how we're facilitating that conversation, let me take you through the timeline. Um, so when do these conversations really take place with you all, right? And like I said before, before um, this timeline is based off of our lease scenarios. And again, it's because that is where we have the most um, risk and then our federal space kind of backs off of the same timeline. So again, the idea is that we're identifying your space needs at 36 months, meaning we're, we're meeting with you at 36 months out. Like I said before, we internally are already having discussions and thinking about your space, making sure we have the right information and bring it to the table. So that way, when we come to you, we have information to share um, that can then drive or influence the decision we make on your occupancy. Um, going forward, right, we take about six months to really kind of develop these strategic requirements with you. So once we come to you at 36 months, we utilize what we call a client project agreement. This is what I was talking about facilitating this conversation and we'll get into that in the next slide. We discuss and validate. And then the idea is we have agreement on these strategic requirements at the 30 months out period before an expiration. Um, for prospectus projects, the timeline's a little bit different. It's earlier, obviously. Um, and you can see that in parentheses below. What I do wanna make sure also that everyone understands is this is the baseline timeline. We can come to you earlier if we feel a project is more complex and we will always let you know why we're coming to you if we do come to, come to you earlier. Um, and then in our federal space too, we may even be coming to you um, outside of this timeline if there's triggers um, to the inventory that that has us, you know, having to have these strategic discussions with you. But again, you know, that will be facilitated. That information will be shared with you, you know, right out, right out the, um, at the start. Uh, next slide. All right, so how do we facilitate this conversation? And like I said, um, it's a document that we call the Client Project Agreement. Hopefully most of you have already seen a version of this, um, but this Client Project Agreement is really just a tool of communication. It's a way for us to make sure that we understand what your current space looks like and, and what that means as far as, you know, is that space meeting your needs? Um, are there changes that we need to make? Um, what does your future occupancy need to look like? Um, so we take a whole host of information and really share it in what we call this client project agreement part one. And like I said before, all that internal analysis that we do before we even meet with you, this is where it lands. It comes in the CPA part one, and we share that information with you as kind of a value add um, and make sure that, you know, any information that we have, any I'm seeing that there's no sound. Can you all hear me? Tasneem, I can hear you just fine. 
Okay. All right. Sorry. I just saw somebody chat that. Um, so again, the idea is that we are um, bringing pertinent information to the table before we even get into what your future requirements could look like. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for letting me know you can hear me. Um, all right. Next slide. All right, so again, you know, I, I just wanna end with really kind of making sure that everyone understands, you know, the timelines that we have associated um, with our strategic requirements and, and coming to you early to plan around your occupancy needs. Now, with that said, we understand there's always outliers. Um, like we said, you know, there's gonna be times where we have to come to you early. There might be times where it does take you a little bit more time to, to get back to us on your requirements. But the one ask that we have today is that you collaborate with us. When we reach out with that CPA part one, meet with us. We understand, you know, we're giving you kind of this overview of, of what planning needs to look like, but we also understand there's a hu huge elephant in the room, right? We understand with the pandemic, there's a lot of unknowns. And when we say, hey, come collaborate with us and talk about your future occupancy, we understand there's a lot of agencies, a lot of you that, that we just don't know all the answers to what space needs to look like, right? Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's across the board. We understand it. Um, our ask today is still come and meet with us, talk to us, because we do. We have a lot of information. We have a lot of expertise in our agency. Um, we have a lot of solutions that we can bring to the table to even help work through some of those requirements unknowns. Um, we have workplace specialists um, that have a host of, of expertise around you know, different types of solutions. Um, if funding is an issue, we have solutions that we created in the last two years to really help around that. Um, and so again, you know, from this discussion, we want you to understand we have a planning process, but more so I would say your main takeaway is collaborate with us. When we come to you at 36 months out or earlier, work with us and we can bring, um, like I said, information. All right. I think, unfortunately, we, Tazim, I think we're, and, we're and seeing not, it frozen there. Oh, oh there sorry. you go. Uh, sorry about that. We, we just want to make sure you collaborate with us and, and, and you know, we can help you work through uh, decisions around your occupancy. All right, next slide. All right, so like we said before, um, after each of our um, pieces here, we will be sharing um, the resources and materials. I wanna bring your attention to this first website, um, the Occupancy Planning and Requirements Development. Um, that's where a lot of the resources around what I just talked about exist. Um, and then I also wanna bring you to the recorded training that's on 221, Occupancy Planning and Solutions. To me, this not only takes what I shared with you today, but really goes into those solutions that we have in GSA that can help you work through some of the barriers um, that you might be facing because there are so many unknowns out there, especially in the last two years. And so again, you know, don't let the unknowns stop you from talking to us. We can, we can work through some of those um, decisions with you. All right. That's all I had. Thank you, everybody. And Victor, I'll, I'll hand it back to you. All right. Thank you very much, Tesneem. Um, we do have a couple of questions out here. So at the sure. end of each section, we'll be going through just a couple of questions. Uh, others will be saved for the end. Um, first question from Tony is, does funding have to be identified prior to the CPA being worked? Seems like a confusing kind of chicken and the egg situation. Right. Um, <laughs> funding, funding does not need to be identified during the CPA process. Um, during the client project agreement process, so during those strategic requirements, we're really trying to figure out what the funding need might even be. Um, and so what you'll find in the CPA um, is just discussion. And then what we will bring to the table is a very high level, um, high level estimate on what the cost could be. So this, this part of our process should really help um, you all as our customers figure out how to budget, right? Um, and, and vice versa for us too. Um, and so that that is part of that collaboration. Very nice. Um, next question we have is from Danny. It's uh, okay. the VBA has a leased office through the VBA. 
what would it take to get that space under a GSA lease? That is a big question. <laughs> and without knowing um, all the details around that, um, let's, how about if we put that in the parking lot and we can probably yeah. get a more um, expert level uh, a decision on that, we would probably pull in our national planning manager to talk about it. But good question. Very much fine by me. Uh, so thank you for that rundown on what it takes to get into planning a space, Tasneem. Uh, moving forward in the process on the next slide, um, we now have Kelly Ellison, who's going to detail pricing your space. Kelly Ellison works in our pricing policy and tools division. She is a member of a team responsible for reviewing, updating, and maintaining operating practices for renting price for rent pricing policy. Uh, Kelly has been with GSA for 16 years and began her career in the career development intern program and returned to portfolio after two years of rotations. Kelly, take it away. Thanks, Victor. Quick sound check. You can hear me? Yes? I hear you loud and clear. Wonderful. And thanks, Tasneen. Um, for that introduction. My goal here in these next few slides is to kind of give you an elementary framework around some key terms of pricing policy. So you'll have more of a basic understanding of it. But what I really do encourage is you to take advantage of the pricing training that we have. There's a link at the end of my slides so that you can really get a deeper understanding of pricing. I promise you it is riveting, you will love it. So our first slide here, I wanna talk about some key pricing terms. Now, what is pricing policy? We have price policies and procedures that are detailed in our pricing desk guide that really talk about how we price real estate and related services to our federal customers. And that's both in owned and leased space. And what you'll notice on my slides is in the bottom right corner, I have a reference to the pricing desk guide if you wanna find out more information about the specific topic that I'm talking about. So what is the rent? That is the amount that PBS charges you, the customer agency, for space and related services. These rates approximate commercial charges for comparable space. And in fact, GSA is mandated to do so, as James mentioned, by the Federal Property and Administrative Services Act of 1949. Lastly, a main focus or part of pricing policy is the occupancy agreement or OA. That is a concise business statement it's the governing relationship between PBS and the customer agency for uh, specific space assignments. Now, if you recall in Tasneen's presentation where she showcased the PBS project life cycle, uh, during that first phase, when she was talking about developing the client project agreement, this is the time area where you would also be working or we would be working on developing that initial OA for you. So about 18 to 36 months out, as she said, uh, before you need your space is when this OA is going to be developed. One point I want to make about the OA is that we are currently going some renovations of the OA, if you will. They're going sig under significant revisions. And so some of those OAs will be removed altogether and incorporated into our pricing desk guide, and some will be revised. So we're going to have a new look to the OA, and our goal is to be able to show customers that new look by summer of 2022, so next year. So please stay tuned for that. Next slide. Now, some other terms you need to be familiar with uh, because they are priced differently is federal space versus lease space. So federal space is the space that is actually held in our GSA inventory and we rent that to the tenant or customer agency. In that case, the rent is based on an appraisal, a fair annual rent appraisal or return on investment, ROI and sometimes other charges are added in. In our lease space, that is a situation where GSA enters into a lease with a lessor and we pass that rent that we have to pay onto the tenant agency. So the rent is charged to the client agency as a pass-through of our underlying lease contract rent. Plus any operating costs that aren't performed to the lease would be added to that, as well as our PBS fee and any other applicable charges. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> how does that rent get to us? Well, Congress gives the agency money or appropriations to pay us rent. In turn, your agency takes that money, the rent, and pays it to us, and it goes into our FBF fund, the Federal Buildings Fund. So then we take that money that has been deposited into our FBF fund, and it goes into different budget accounts. As you can see below, the rental space is one of those budget accounts. Now, 
If you look to the left side, you see an example of sometimes we get direct appropriations that go from Congress directly to our FBF funds, so it is not paid to rent. The example I always give of that situation is the ARA Act, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of uh, 2009. And that's where GSA got money directly from Congress, um, and that was to update our building infrastructure. So normally we'll get it through rent, but there are situations where we have gotten direct appropriation from Congress. Next slide, please. So when we talk about our rent, there are several line items in the rent bill, and probably the most important is the shell rent line item. So what is shell rent? Shell rent is going to be what you are charged for the complete enveloping structure. That's your base building systems, the finished common areas that adjoin all of the tenant areas together. And we have to use that shell definition as it appears in the pricing desk guide in its entirety without deviating from it. It's also even included on our standard lease forms. I do wanna mention that a lot of times lessors will have uh, building design guides that says you have to have a certain type of carpet, a certain type of wall covering in their space. Just because an item is part of a design guide does not mean that the item is now a shell. And as you can see from this picture, we've looked at some of the most um, basic or most known shell, rent, shell items. So you have your HVAC for a general office space. You'll also have a suspended ceiling. You have your wall board on the exterior perimeter of the wall and a level concrete floor, as well as electrical service that goes to the general open office layout. I wanna note that also tenant, tenant agency driven upgrades to building shell, we call these shell enhancements. So for example, maybe you need an increased floor load because you have some heavy equipment, or maybe you need increased HVAC, you need to upgrade the HVAC because you're doing some type of, of lab work or something where you need to make sure the air is filtered appropriately. Those type of things are really an upgrade to the building shell, so they're considered TIs. So what is a TI? Let's go to the next slide and I'll let you know. TI is probably the second most important line item on the rent bill, tenant improvements. That's what TI stands for. And with TIs, we are talking about the finishes and fixtures that typically take that shell space that we saw on the previous slide to a condition that is finished and usable for you, the tenant agency. Now, the tenant agency elects how that space is finished out, as long as it's functional and compliant with applicable building codes and standards. What's important to note also about the TI though, is that it can only be used to pay for items that are real property or items which become real property when they are attached or affixed to the building in such a way that it is not easily removable. The TI allowance cannot fund items such as furniture, microwaves, computers, artwork, TV, and et cetera. Those things are considered personal property. And as James mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, FAST, the Federal Acquisition Service, would deal with those items. Now, in this pictorial, what you'll see is shell items are in blue and tenant improvement items are in red. What I really want to point out here is you can see the terrazzo striped floor is on the outside of the agency space as well as the inside. In this case, this was a lessor design that was mandated. However, in the common area, that would be a shell item. And in the tenant space, that would be a tenant improvement item. Likewise, you can see the wood paneling on the outside in the common corridor, corridor is a shell item. And the paneled wall sign on the interior of the space and the tenant space is a TI item. So again, that just stresses that the design guides of the lessor do not dictate whether an item is TI or whether it is shell. Next slide, please. Now here on this last, slide is what a typical rent bill might look like for you. And you will notice they're pretty similar. There's just a few uh, changes or differences that lease space has that federal space does not have. So as I mentioned, you have your shell line component. That is the complete developing structure. It includes the base building systems and the finished common area of the building that adjoin the tenant areas together. The next line you have is your TI. That, again, are the finishes and fixtures that take that space from just that open shell condition to something that your agency can really use. 
we didn't talk about it in this presentation, but then you have operating costs, which are your utilities and your custodial services. In our lease space, you have real estate taxes. Those are a direct pass-through. So whatever the lessor charges GSA, we then in turn charge the tenant agency. You will not have those in our, um, in our federally owned space. We have something called uh, BSAC, Building Specific Amortized Capital. And what that is are any type of security countermeasures that serve a building or a lease. These are not shell, these are not TI, these are a separate line item on your rent bill. Now, again, in your lease space, you will see that you have something called GSA installed building improvements. These are improvements that PBS pays for in a lease space. It is extremely rare. In my whole 16 years of being here, I have maybe seen it happen one time, but it is a component of lease rent bill. And uh, then we have uh, the PBS fee I wanted to point out, you'll have in lease space, but not in federally owned space. That is a 7% fee for cancelable space, and it gets lowered to 5% fee for non-cancelable space. And I'll touch on those a little bit later when I talk about release of space. And what that fee is meant to cover is the contract risk that GSA assumes, as well as the lease acquisition services and the lease administrative services. Next slide, please. So on this slide, I've just put in some resources for you. Of course, we have a link to the pricing desk guide, but I also wanna highlight the link to rent on the web where customers are able to directly access their rent bill as well as electronic OA, which is another customer facing application where you can get real OA time information. We have some fact sheets about OAs as well as rent on the web. And again, what I really wanna stress is that space pricing basics, it is a stellar presentation if I do say so myself, and I'm not tooting my own horn because I gave the presentation, but it is really informative for folks. People seem to like it. So that concludes the presentation. If, if you happen to have more questions about pricing in general or about your OA and you can't find answers in the training or the pricing desk guide, I suggest you contact your regional client planning managers or your real estate specialists for questions regarding your space or your OA requirements. So um, at this time, I'm gonna hand it back to Victor who I believe may have some questions for me. Victor. Hi Kelly. All right, thank you very much for that very informative uh, presentation on pricing. Also, I do recommend the uh, other presentation she mentioned, uh, also not tooting my own horn, but I might have posted it. Um, <laughs> but we did have quite a few questions going out. Um, reminder to everyone, please put relevant questions in the Q&A pod, not in the chat, so we can better keep track of them and make sure things are answered, either at the end of the presentation or afterward. Um, we did have one question here in the chat. It's a bit of a long one, so I'm trying to paraphrase it. Federal tenant aquifers require some change. If a um, GSA building requires some change, does the tenant agency have to contribute to those costs in proportion to their proportionate space usage in the building? Um, okay, so operate, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, so I'm going to start with the caveat that let's say you are in your space and yes, you want to make some changes. You had a wall here and now you want to take out a wall. This is in the middle, you have a 10 year OA term and this is year five. That is a TI, that means that is a tenant responsibility and you would have to supply uh, RWA, which we will talk about later to get those items, uh, to, to get that wall removed or, or repositioned. Let's say we are talking about something security in the building, that would go to the BSAC line and that is charged to all tenants on a prorated basis. So it really depends on the type of update or change and where it falls. Um, that is what determines whether the tenant agency pays for it directly with RWA or whether it's a different line item on your rent bill. All right, thank you very much for the very thorough answer. Um, all right, next slide. Uh, we're going to move on to procuring your space. And this will be led by Charlie Johnson and Ken Idle. 
Uh, Charlie has or Charlie joined GSA in 2002 as a leasing specialist in Region 3. He's transferred to Region 4 after volunteering to help with disaster relief efforts following Hurricane Katrina. I know that there was a hurricane related question earlier in the Q&A pod. Charlie might be able to answer that or provide some feedback when we answer questions after all this presentation. Uh, in Region 4, he has served as the lease contracting officer, team leader, branch chief, and lease acquisition officer. Then in 2016, Charlie joined the Office of Leasing and has become the national program manager for the Disaster Leasing Program and has since um, written multiple chapters for the Leasing Desk Guide, as well as the development of multiple lease acquisition models. Very storied career. Uh, Ken Idle is a program manager with the Office of Leasing in the Center of Program Oversight, Compliance, and Workforce Development. Ken has 13 years of 1170 contracting experience as an intern, leasing specialist, and lease contracting officer. Ken currently manages the lease acquisition training, a mandatory training for all lease contracting officers to obtain their warrants, as well as four additional national training programs for the leasing community. I pass it off to you, gentlemen. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. All right, well, my name is Charlie Johnson, and I'm going to take us through an overview of the leasing process. If we can move on to the next slide, please. All right, so I will have to do the obligatory disclaimer that it is uh, difficult to take the leasing process and distill it down to this level. Fortunately, we do have some presentations that we're going to share some links on later that go through this in more detail. So this will be an exceptionally high-level overview uh, and we do have some presentations that go through this in two hours, and we even have a one week class uh, that literally takes a whole week and goes through this process that uh, you can go through if you have that kind of interest. So the leasing process up here on the screen starts with requirements development, and that's what Tasneem spoke to us about earlier. That's where we get to know a little bit about the space that we need to get for you and what kind of requirements you have for the space in order for it to accomplish your mission. After that, we move into pre-solicitation. Pre-solicitation is, is where we uh, approach the market and learn a little bit about the market and its ability to provide the space that you need. And then we go into the solicitation phase. In the solicitation phase, we will put a request for lease proposals out on the market and we will then move into negotiations. At the end of the negotiations, we'll make an award and that's when we actually execute the lease and we have awarded a federal contract. After that, Ken Idle will take us through the post-award portion where we go through design and then build out all the way up to occupancy. So let's move on to the next slide and pre-solicitation. All right, so pre-solicitation here is the main point of this is the market survey. The market survey is where the government team is going to get together, that's GSA and the client. We're gonna get together and we're gonna actually walk through the buildings that GSA has been able to locate. So our role in this process is that we're going to approach the market, as we said. We'll do that by putting out an advertisement. We'll do that by picking up the phone and, and just making some good old-fashioned phone calls. We'll try to find properties, and then we'll pre-screen them using the agreed-upon requirements. This is where it's so important that we get requirements development right, because it saves us all a lot of time if we identify all of your requirements up front. So we'll pre-screen the properties so that if we get 10 expressions of interest from our ad and five of them are not capable of meeting your requirement, then we won't go look at those five. They might be outside the delineated area. They might not have enough space uh, for what we've agreed upon that you need. So we'll pre-screen those out. Then what we're left with is, is the buildings that appear, at least at this stage, capable of meeting your requirement. So we'll lead the market survey. We'll set up the logistics, we'll make the appointments, we'll have all the directions on how to get there. And then we'll also fill out that key document, the market survey forms. So the market survey forms are where we're gonna have a bunch of information on the building, what it has, what it doesn't have. And at the end of that is the very important signature blocks for the GSA representative and the client. So what is your role? Your role, all the way at the top, and the most important one, is to have all of your required decision makers available. We do not, as a normal policy, have multiple layers of market surveys. We don't do an initial market survey and then uh, an executive market survey. That's not a, a good use of time, and it's not a good use of government uh, travel money as well. So what we ask is, is that 
uh, all of your decision makers are available either to be on the survey or to have a designee that they trust uh, that can speak for them. So then we go through the market survey and we'll review the properties against the agreed upon requirements. Again, we come back to the importance of doing requirements development well. Uh, we don't wanna be in the middle of a survey and find out about a, a new requirement that, that might change everything and cause us to have to go all the way back to the beginning and, and back to finding uh, other properties. So we review them against the agreed upon requirements. And then at the end of the market survey, you'll work with the GSA team. And hopefully we have an agreement of the buildings that can meet the requirements that we've identified and the ones that can't. So if we had five properties that we looked at, perhaps uh, three of them work and, and two of them don't. We'll sign those market survey forms. And by signing those market survey forms, at the market survey, it helps to prevent delays and, and increasing the amount of time of the lease acquisition process. When we have the market survey form signed at the end of the survey, we're able to quickly move into our next stage. So on the next slide, please. Um, very quickly here, I will note that we do have different models. Uh, and we're talking to you about what we call the traditional process, which is what we use with our global model. And this is where the market survey occurs before the solicitation is issued. We do have increasingly uh, new models. We have AAAP, which has, has gone nationwide now uh, for a number of years. And we have a brand new SLAT model that also uses uh, the AAAP process in a, a somewhat modified way. With AAAP and the SLAT model, the market survey happens after we get bids. So we're talking through today the traditional or global model process. Understand, uh, please, that if you are uh, getting your space through AAAP or through the SLAT model, uh, that the sequencing of this might be a little bit different. Okay. All right, so now we're at the solicitation phase. We have gone to the market, we found five properties, we toured them, we decided that three of them can work. So now we have to actually get a request for lease proposal package together. This is how we will formally invite the market to submit a bid to the federal government for this government contract, which in this case is a lease. The RLP package has two main components. We have the request for lease proposal, which is on the left. This is the solicitation. The solicitation describes the space that we're looking for, and it describes how we're going to conduct the procurement and how we're going to determine who is one. On the uh, left, on the right hand side of the screen, we have the lease. The lease is the contract. This is what the offerors are bidding on. So this sets forth the duties, uh, the rights, the obligations of, of the lessor and also the government during the term of the lease. These two things go together into a package, the RLP package, along with a number of other documents uh, that we kind of refer to as the fine print, such as the general clauses, solicitation provisions, and so forth. So now we'll go to the next section. So when we're negotiating these leases and, and doing this procurement, we have three main, and I would stress main elements of rent, depending on your lease, you might have a few more. Uh, the building shell we covered earlier in pricing policy, we use uh, building shell to cover the cost of the uh, overall building structure, the base building systems, and we use what is called a warm lit shell. And a warm lit shell, as we saw on that slide earlier, includes things like the tile grid and includes some lighting because it is a lit shell and basic HVAC because it is warm. Uh, it's understood that in private sector real estate, there are different uh, ways of doing the shell, and that can vary by market. Uh, some markets use what is referred to as a, a cold, dark shell, and some markets use something in between. Because we're the federal government, and in order to have consistency, we use the warm lit shell all over the country. That way, it's uh, always clear what's in the contract and, and what people are bidding on and what's covered under the shell rent. The next line item here is the operating cost. The operating cost, this is what we pay the landlord to operate the building. Uh, this includes things like your light bill, the water bill, and the janitorial cost. Most of our leases are what we refer to as fully serviced. There are some leases that are 
less than fully serviced, also sometimes referred to as net leases in the private sector, a less than fully serviced lease may not include some of those things, but we always as a default try to obtain fully serviced leases and the vast majority of our leases are, are fully serviced. The last item we have here are tenant improvements. So tenant improvements are basically anything beyond the shell that you need in order to make the space workable for you. So we start with that wormlet shell, and as you add the uh, walls for your offices, as we add uh, some of those other uh, improvements that uh, we covered earlier, those would be tenant improvements. There are other line items. Um, we discussed earlier briefly things like building specific amortized capital, which is your security in most cases. Uh, you could have a line item for an antenna. Uh, there are certainly other line items that are, are not quite as a, uh, universally applicable as these three. So again, your lease may vary. Okay, we'll move to the next side. Our lease offer platform is something that we're, we're very proud of. We've talked a, a couple of times about AAAP. So AAAP is, is our automated advanced acquisition platform. Uh, this program was around in DC for a very long time and now has, has gone nationwide and has become very well established. Uh, more and more of our business is being done through AAAP and that is saving us tremendous amounts of time and money. It's also saving the private sector tremendous amounts of time and money, which of course helps us to pass that through to you in the form of more competitive offers. Uh, AAAP receives their offers through the lease offer platform, which is an online portal where offerors go in and uh, they can enter their offer directly into the system. More recently, we have expanded our lease offer platform for the requirements specific acquisition platform or RSAP. RSAP brought all of our other lease acquisition models uh, into the 21st century and online. So we are no longer uh, getting offers in paper. Uh, we're no longer getting offers that are scanned and emailed to us. And this is also another way in which we're speeding up uh, how we do business and, and helping to drive down costs. So the RSAP and AAAP platforms allow people to go in and fill out their bid and submit it online. Now there's no human touch time required to review a form. Uh, this also helps clean up a lot of things that used to slow down procurements, uh, things like math errors. Uh, so a lot of my career, we would have to take a paper form, we'd have to check all of the math, and if some of the math didn't work out, we'd have to go back and uh, perhaps uh, allow somebody to submit a revised offer or, or submit a clarification. Uh, all of that is, is a thing of the past now that we have moved fully online with the lease offer platform. So once they submit their offers, we'll go to the next slide. So now they've submitted their offers, we would go through a negotiation. And once we decide that we think that we have a winner, uh, we're going to start this two-pronged process here. We're going to work with you as the client, uh, sending you a recommendation letter. This can also, of course, be an email nowadays. Uh, the recommendation letter or email will say, we've finished the procurement. We believe that uh, 1234 West Main Street has won, and uh, we'll ask you to concur on that award. So if we have done this using the global model, uh, you will have already seen this building in which case then you've already uh, signed the market survey form. And so hopefully this is very easy for you to simply say, yes, uh, we have uh, agreed to this particular building and this is fine, please move forward with award. Uh, if we're using one of our newer models like AAAP or the slot model, uh, this is where we would do the, the building tour that we talked to earlier. We would say, okay, we've done the procurement. Um, we now would like to go, let's go look at this building because this building appears to win uh, it has gone through our, our pre-screening and a, 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 a vetting process that is built into those models. So we believe that this is the right building for you. On the offeror side, we will send them a draft lease. So we'll say we've, we've got your offer in and now we're gonna send you a draft lease that contains the details of your offer as we understand it. And then that goes to the offeror, they sign and they return it to GSA when we have the signed draft lease from the lessor and we have the uh, okay from the agency that, that signed uh, recommendation letter or, or acceptance, 
then the GSA lease contracting officer will execute that lease contract and provide everybody uh, with notice of execution. And at that point, we have our executed lease. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide here. So we'll end this section with a, a bunch of links here. Uh, I will point out two that I, I think are, are particularly important. Uh, please look at the fact sheet for AAAP. If you are brand new to the leasing process, uh, please learn about our AAAP program and how, as it says there, it's streamlining the leasing process for earlier delivery. Also, if you would like to know more about the things that I've covered very briefly here, please go to our recorded Leasing 101 that we did only a few months ago. Uh, that is posted on YouTube. And that goes through everything that I've just talked about in roughly two hours. Uh, so it'll give you a lot more detail on these things that I've only just touched upon. So now I'm gonna transition this presentation over to my colleague, Ken Idle, and he is gonna take us through the next part of the leasing process uh, post-award. Yep, now that Charlie has talked about the procurement actions for acquiring agency space, I'm gonna tackle building it to meet your spec on the next slide. So the lease is written with timelines and milestones to help guide the team after award to a finished product. A few of those key steps and deliverables are design intent drawings or DIDs, construction drawings, CDs, and the tenant improvement TI negotiation. Each of these steps are outlined in the lease for exactly what we get, who provides it, and what's covered via the various rent components. You know, for this slide, the important parts are DIDs are usually a general layout of the space, they capture your design elements and they give enough info for the CDs to be created. DIDs aren't very technical at this point. They're more like a sketch of where the walls, doors, and things like outlets should be located. Now, CDs, on the other hand, are technical. They're plans from which the space must be permitted. So they'll have to have sufficient professional quality and detail and have guidance to the trades for how to produce the finished product. Once the CDs are finished with reviews, the GC then takes them on two tracks, pricing with the subs, and permitting with the building authority in that area. So notice those two bolded words on this slide, approves and reviews. It's important to emphasize these because we do approve those general space layouts and the DIDs, but we do not approve CDs, we just review them. So why is that? Well, you know, due to the technical nature of CDs, the responsibility of the CDs must remain with the landlord and their architect and engineers. We never want to own or give the impression we are taking any ownership of a techno technical solution in a lease, whether an initial build, later if we do alterations, or if we're experiencing problems with building systems at any point in the occupancy. So back to design. The timing of each of these elements is in the lease and are set via the baselines back in the RLP lease drafting. So um, now adjustments may be needed to the baseline schedule along the way, but keep in mind at this point, we do have contracted timeframes and changes might come with trade-offs. So make sure you work with your GSA team to get good and reasonable timelines for the drafting of the RLP and lease documents. Uh, next slide, please. So again, we've seen this a couple of times. This picture is a description of the GSA building shell as it's defined in the standard lease language. And like we've mentioned a few times before, warm lit shell, right? So as you can see here, that's an open office ceiling, open office HVAC system and open office lighting fixtures that can meet certain foot candle requirements. And you know, this is important because we customize that space or as we customize that space beyond the shell, those build out and coordination costs begin to fall on our side of the cost ledger. Now we do have procurement methods such as the turnkey method where we know the build out costs before award. However, in those situations, we must have biddable designs very early in the process. And we know that's not always possible or feasible. So when attempting to consider buildings equally in a procurement, we assume each space is first generation in our global RLP and lease. That means we have the right to have the landlord demo that space down to the slabs as part of the shell cost at no additional cost to us after award. So, this right to demo down to the slabs enables us to always have TIs coordinated with the shell installations, and we never have to accept shell items that are already installed or pay for, and or pay for their replacement. So um, we'll talk about the process of construction price determination on the next slide, but the concept of the right of coordinated TIs with shell items is important to emphasize. So next slide, please. Now, once those CDs are handed over with no additional comments, we get competitive bidding back from the GCs and their subs. Uh, the lease calls for those to be in the CSI master format using a tick table. That helps our independent government estimators or IGEs 
to analyze whether or not we're getting a fair and reasonable deal on those build out costs. So knowing quantities, material, labor costs, that enables the IGEs to do their research on the shell TI separation, along with the proper prices on each of those elements. Now, I will say that the shell TI separation is sort of an art and science due to those coordination with the TI. So each IGE will likely have their own process, you know, but for us, it's probably a good rule of thumb that anytime you move one of those warm lit shell items, there will be a cost. So each new wall or door, it creates complexity in the system and additional materials, which will come with, with additional labor and material costs. Uh, the next slide, please. So this may not come as a huge surprise to those that uh, have been working on construction projects, but sometimes our scope of work exceeds that TIA in the lease or tenant improvement allowance in the lease. You know, we do our best pre-award to estimate the cost, our IGEs and our project managers attempt to get our projects fully funded via the rough order of magnitude estimates back in requirements development. But sometimes we are still short once the prices are obtained. You know, in those cases, we have a couple of main choices. We can either de-scope or we can pay via reimbursable work authorization or RWA for that overage. That RWA does not get amortized in a lease like the tenant improvement allowance and must be obligated before we let the landlord build anything via our notice to proceed. So we can't build half a wall while we wait for additional RWA funds. We must have a fully funded project before we can move forward. And finally, those RWA funds will be paid lump sum to the landlord after the work is inspected and accepted. So. With that, I'll move over to the, the Q&A or the next topic. So Victor, sorry about that. You? Thanks. Um, we actually are going to just move straight into the next section uh, in the interest of time. Uh, so there's a lot of good questions coming in. We do not have time to answer them. We still have a lot of material to get through. Um, so I will introduce the next speaker. It will be Don Cottle, uh, who is going to break down the process for building out your space. Uh, Don Cottle started his career with GSA in 1992 as an engineering trainee in the regional office in New York. While he was in New York, he worked his way up to project manager and has experience managing a wide range of repair and alteration projects. Uh, Don changed roles and came to Chicago in 2006 as the property manager for the Everett M. Dirksen uh, U.S. Courthouse and then returned to his technical background in 2009 as the technical supervisor for Chicagoland. In 2012, Don took on the role as a program analyst EPM coordinator uh, in the region's newly formed project management office. Passing it off to you, Don. All right, thanks, Victor. Um, a lot has been said uh, about the life cycle. And so Tasneem did a lot to talk about the planning and uh, initiation phases and how important it is to really get your uh, requirements up front. Um, and I'm going to talk mostly about the execution and closeout phases as it relates to federal space. Um, so similar to uh, what Ken and Charlie just talked about a lot of discussion about the TI, uh, the warmlet shell, and all of those things that, that go into uh, the requirements for your space. Um, so we'll move to the next slide. The importance of execution really starts with execute with the acquisition planning in federal space. Um, so a lot of all of what you've heard still applies in federal space. We still need to identify. Um, you know, shell costs versus TI costs, and that's all going to be done as part of the estimating process. Uh, but what are some of the key considerations as we start to think about uh, executing your space needs in federal space? First is, is a design needed? So we're going we're gonna to make that determination as to whether we need to, you know, bring an architect or engineer on board to put kind of, as Ken just talked about, design intent drawings together, construction drawings together. And throughout that entire process, we're gonna follow any potential agency to design guides that are uh, applicable, um, as well as our own guides in terms of what, is, what are the proper uh, policies and procedures to follow in terms of um, constructing our space. And I'll show that in the resources on my last slide. Then we also need to consider still on, Still on the previous slide there, Victor, sorry. Uh, what other support services might be needed? We might need inspection services. We might need testing services in order to 
move you through the execution phase. Part of acquisition planning is deciding what the right delivery method for your project might be. And we have multiple delivery methods similar to what Charlie described in terms of the different lease methods in terms of how we determine or how we bring a lesser on board. Similar in the federal space, we have different uh, methods of bringing our contractors on board. Some of those include what we call a traditional design bid build. It's very linear in which we bring a designer on board, design the space for you, go through a cost estimating, let you know what the space is going to cost to fit out in the construction phase, and then bid out the construction phase. We have other opportunities through design build where if we're able to put all of the requirements enough in enough detail together, we can actually bring one contractor on board to do both the design and build phase. The design phase is an important piece because as, as Ken described, the construction drawings are really the, the piece of the puzzle that tell the contractor what to do. Um, so we, we can do that in the design build fashion and kind of compress things together. There are other hybrids of that, CMC method, design build bridging. These are all, all, uh, all variations of being able to kind of deliver the space for you um, and at the end have a turnkey solution for you uh, to occupying your space. Then we consider other acquisition things like considering the right contract pool. We use IDIQs or indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contractors quite a bit across the country. And these are already established relationships that we have with contractors in different markets in order for us to be able to get some of the work done faster. This is particularly applicable if you have small dollar value amount projects. The larger the dollar value uh, of the project, it's certainly gonna take a little bit longer to get contractors. The pool of contractors, we might need to, to start researching other pools. Those other pools might be full and open competition. We might need to go out on the market and seek other sources other than the ones that we kind of pre-screened via our IDIQ methods. We may also need to set aside some of our things, uh, uh, some of our procurements. And that is typically based on either needing to find a specialized experience um, because we have a unique requirement or because we have certain socioeconomic goals that we need to meet. You know, we as an agency, um, as was implied in the very beginning, you know, we're working for the taxpayer as well as you, the customer. And therefore, some of those socioeconomic goals are there to help promote, for instance, small businesses um, in terms of attracting small businesses to do work with us. And there are other socioeconomic goals that we have. Uh, to meet in order to kind of kind of spread the wealth, if you will, uh, of different contracting contractors getting work with the federal government. So then we'll move on to the next slide. Project closeout. So I don't mean to short shortchange the execution. Execution is a lot that goes into it, but a lot of a lot of the things that go into it we've already discussed, um, and the length of execution can take. Um, you know, depending on the size of the project, could take a few weeks to several months, even a couple of years, depending on, again, the size of your project and the complexity of what we need to build out for you. But after that project is, is done and built out, we're talking about acceptance. We're talking about final inspection of the space, identifying any maybe punch list items that need to be taken care of, determining if the space is ready for occupancy, okay? And then ultimately scheduling a move-in, where however that looks like, what is your ultimate move-in date um, for the space we've just built out for you? Then we get into contractually and financially closing out the project. Um, that's going to include paying those contractors who've now all done done all that work for you. Talking about rent start so that you can start paying rent for the space that you occupy. Closing out RWAs if you've given us money. Uh, via an RWA, we need to return any potential balances that are left on that RWA. And that's part of the financial closeout. And then lastly, turning over to operations or facilities management, providing all of those drawings and specifications to our facility staff and giving them training on any new or unique equipment that may be uh, in your space that they need to know about 
so that they can continue a relationship with you once the construction portion of your space is done. Next slide. And so quickly here, we have a couple of resources, a um, couple of client enrichment series already that speak to some of these topics um, in terms of how we truly do some of the estimating um, and some of our standards. The P100 is our facility standards, which really dictates how we build out our space. And that is a supplement or, or the, the agency design guides are usually a supplement to our P100 facility standards in terms of what space can and should look like. All right, thank you very much for uh, your presentation on building out your space, Don. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, next, we're going to move into making sure that you have a space built to suit your needs. And Tracy Talbert is going to be um, detailing occupying your space. Uh, Tracy has 28 years of experience in, with GSA in the facility management field, so she's quite the expert. Take it away, Tracy. Thank you, Victor. Once the construction of your space is complete, the next stop in the PBS real estate journey is occupancy. In this section, we will talk about transitioning to occupancy, your facility manager for federal buildings, federal building operations and maintenance, and your facility manager for lease space. We'll look at occupancy in federal buildings and lease space uh, individually because each is handled differently. So moving in, um, GSA will assist in the move process regardless of who, who manages or procures the move. We're going to help you with move coordination, which may include access to the loading dock, freight elevator usage, and for leases, we'll also coordinate with the lessor. Um, by this time, you should have already met your facility manager. They're typically involved in the projects uh, for building out space. Um, we collectively refer to the uh, facility manager, or FM, as a role title for all individuals responsible for the management of our own and lease portfolio. Um, actual titles of individuals you might notice include property managers, building managers, uh, lease administration managers, and lease management specialists, to name a few. Uh, so you're going to see several different titles, but they're all considered facility managers. You and your facility manager will exchange important contact information to include emergency contacts as well as the service re uh, discuss the service request process. And then the transition phase is also an opportunity to get to know your facility, such as learning the local facility layout, uh, including security, evacuation routes, parking, amenities, and of course the occupant emergency plan. What? Uh, you're in federal facilities, the facility manager is responsible for the entire asset. So that's the biggest difference here. Um, they manage the facility infrastructure, which includes the roof, windows, facade, doors, foundation, and basement. The facility manager is responsible for maintaining a safe and secure working environment for all occupants and visitors and operating and maintaining the building in order to provide an efficient, productive, sustainable, and cost-effective workplace. Facilities manager role is comprised of a broad variety of responsibilities, include serving, including serving as the tenant communication lead, providing updates on projects, policy changes, and community events that may impact or interest the tenant, engaging with and participating on the Facility Security Committee, or FSC. Um, and for reference, the FSC consists of representatives of all federal ten tenants in the facility, uh, Department of Homeland Security, Federal Protective Service, and GSA. And FPS is responsible for identifying and analyzing the threats and vulnerabilities and recommending appropriate countermeasures. And the decision to act on those recommendations is the responsibility of that FSC. So another responsibility of the facility manager is partnering with FPS on facility and ground security, maintaining an up-to-date occupant emergency plan, and working alongside the building's designated official or DO for emergency response coordination, including training and drills. In case you're not familiar, the DO is the highest-ranking official of the primary tenant agency of the federal facility or alternatively, a designee selected by mutual agreement of 10 agency officials is defined by the Interagency Security Committee. Communicating disaster preparedness and building protocol. Uh, another responsibility is participating in the alteration project's ex execution phase, 
as a key stakeholder, either as a project manager or as the facility manager. And in both cases, the FM is involved in communicating and coordinating project milestones and other key activities with you and other building tenants that may affect by, be affected by the work. They also provide building access to tenants as required, which includes providing necessary forms and assistance to obtain access cards, fobs, or keys. And also maintaining a parking roster and addressing any issues with tenants and coordinating access and alternate parking when building work or operations require use of parking space. This also includes coordinating loading dock deliveries, such as for furniture and equipment deliveries. The facility manager is also responsible for monitoring and taking action to improve energy performance, implementing and managing the recycling and composting programs as part of the custodial and trash removal services to divert trash away from landfills, overseeing concessions and food service operations when applicable, such as vending machines, sundry shops, on-site snack bars, grills, cafes, and cafeterias. They also oversee amenities including fitness centers, health units, credit unions, and ATMs and lactation rooms. May, uh, <clears throat> one of the larger responsibilities of the facility manager is maintenance contract administration, such as oversight and quality assurance. So on the next slide, we're going to take a closer look at the maintenance contract administration. So you can see here, uh, this is basically a lot of our service contracts that we have in our federal buildings. So our facility manager is the liaison, your liaison to the maintenance and custodial contractors providing services in our facilities. The facility manager oversees the building, building service calls and responds to tenant inquiries and concerns or issues. They also monitor the mechanical maintenance operations, daily building comfort, for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, also electrical maintenance, elevator, custodial operations, and landscaping. They also ensure operations are following all environmental compliance requirements. They also coordinate above standard services, such as overtime uh, heating and cooling needs, additional janitorial service and maintenance of occupant owned equipment. Um, so for example, if you require additional um, heating or cooling on a Saturday um, because we do provide um, heating and cooling on a 10-hour uh, shift Monday through Friday excluding federal holidays. If you would need that, we would help coordinate that and make sure that you get your heating and cooling and that's an above standard service. It's done on a reimbursable basis. So moving on, so we said we would talk separately or individually about the uh, federal facility manager and the lease facility manager. So the responsibilities are quite different for managing our federal buildings. First of all, the lease facility manager is not responsible for the ass asset. It belongs to the lesser owner and uh, they're responsible for the asset. So um, we are responsible for uh, monitoring the lessor's performance. So we do like to use the term lease administration manager to describe the role of facility managers who are responsible for managing the lease during occupancy. And we also call them LAMs or use the acronym LAM. Um, they act as your tenant liaison and advocate and they serve as the lease contracting officer's representative, monitoring the lessor's performance, verifying lease compliance, and they perform annual inspections, at least annually. Um, they do oftentimes need to come out uh, more often if their deficiencies are found. And they also investigate building issues and respond to escalated service calls. And what I mean by that is uh, there may be uh, typical service calls are going to be uh, sent to your lessor or call, you're going to call your lessor uh, for, or the lessor's property management company for service calls. And what we mean by escalated service calls are those types of calls that are either recurring or, or um, urgent in, in nature that um, first goes to the lesser, you don't hear anything back, then we, um, you would then reach out to your lease administration manager. And they also assist in securing above standard services like we mentioned before, uh, similar to the federal uh, property manager or facility manager. So in summary, your facility manager is your partner and is available to assist you throughout your occupancy and GSA managed space. 
And on this slide, just like the rest of the sections, we have um, several resources that are available to you for facilities management. And uh, we also have a lease management customer guide and a client enrichment series on service expectations in GSA owned and leased space. I'll pass it back to you, Victor. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that detailed description of occupying and inhabiting a new space, Tracy. Uh, now we're going. Now that we're in the space, we may feel the need to alter it. So I'm going to pass the mic to Ashley Carlson uh, for the details on altering your space. Ashley has worked for for GSA for over 18 years, beginning in the finance as a financial management specialist, and now acting as the national program manager manager for reimbursable services. Uh, Ashley. Thanks, Victor. All right, so in the real estate journey, you've heard several times, I think several of my colleagues have mentioned the acronym RWA. Some of you may be familiar with what it is and some of you might go, I have no idea what that is. So I'm gonna quickly touch on it, but I wanna let everybody know that a lot of this information is covered in other training sessions that we do have. One of them is coming up super soon. So I'm gonna broadcast that right at the end so you can have more of an opportunity to learn more. So what is an RWA? RWA stands for Reimbursable Work Authorization. It's the agreement between GSA and our customers of exactly what you need to do. It puts a formal agreement in place. It's contractual between the two sides on you have a need, GSA will fulfill that need. We both agree on what the price estimate should be. It's not firm fixed pricing, of course, it's an estimate. And then we sign everything with ink, so to speak, but I'll get into how that's not actually true in a couple seconds. Um, but it documents the entire process for us. It captures everything that we need in terms of billing so that we know um, the information we need to then have everything happen seamlessly through our different billing modules. G invoicing is something that we're even learning more about and being ready to participate in as that's becoming a mandate that's happening government-wide as well. So the basic thing behind an RWA, it's identifying that basic need. You have a need, it has to be put down, it has to be something that's not a wish, it has to be something you truly want, and it has to be ready to be funded. So I'm gonna get into some more details here as we get in the other slides. Next slide, please, Victor. So there's a difference in our process. We have a work request and an RWA, two different acronyms, somewhat similar letters. I could see some confusion with it, but the biggest thing to understand with them is they build into one another. The work request is truly what it's called. It's where you're sending a request for work. It's like a service ticket, if you will, where you say, GSA, I have a need. My other colleagues have talked about the different parts of the real estate process where in your journey, you figure out you have certain things that you need. You have lease requirements. We go and we're going to find a lease for you. Well, when we do find that, let's say we get in there and the basic, the basic pricing, excuse me, that you're going to provide to GSA through rent it's not gonna be enough. You're gonna need something above that. Not that you wanna pay more money, but you need to build the space out a little bit differently than how it currently is. More than what we would be providing in our tenant improvement allowances, as an example. So what would you do? You would work with GSA to create a work request in our system to say, I need X more. I need this. I need a reconfiguration of my office. I need the paint redone. I need new carpeting different things that you have. It can also be services. We have additional, you just heard Tracy talk about overtime utilities and HVAC. We have those needs as well. The RWA creates the process to reimburse the money to GSA for these things that are outside of the standard rent with PBS. So the work request is you have the need and identify it and send it to us through our system, which is called eRita. I'll talk about it more in another minute. But it essentially puts it in there and starts the bookmark of let's do requirements development. A lot of this, again, part of the real estate journey you've already been through, but it's specific to the parts that you would be reimbursing outside of traditional rent. We'll develop the scope, we'll put together the design and tent drawings, perhaps. All of those things provide an estimate. Then the work request becomes an RWA when you put funding on it. All of this is done in our system. It used to be done on paper. It's awesome that it's in the system because it makes it very transparent and you can see where you are in the process. So Deadlines. I'm sure folks are very familiar with deadlines from many different parts of your career and the government were known for them, right? So the important thing for the RWA program is all the pieces I just talked about have to be done by midnight on September 30th of each fiscal year because we reset the clock. So we have some internal deadlines. Based on where we are in the fiscal year, I'm not going to elaborate too much on what they are because they're not anytime soon since we just started. Next slide, please. So this maps out kind of a 
another depiction of what I just talked through, but some folks I think can glean more from it visually of identifying the difference between the work request and the RWA of what each one does. Remember, the work request becomes the RWA when you add funding. That's the basic way to think about it. It's used by all of our customers. The big thing I wanna drive home here is that everything is done in eReta and it's required. It is not a, hey, it would be nice and you can fill out the 2957 RWA form and send it to us, not an option. It has to be done in our system. Next slide, please. So this walks through taking the entire process since this is a journey. So you guys can see everything you've done thus far in real estate. This is the particular journey for um, RWAs. Again, starting as work requests. Everything that I've talked through is here. Everything you see on the left-hand side of the screen where it has a status, those are actually the statuses that we use in our system. So it works that you would understand what's happening or what needs to happen when your work request or RWA in the system is identified in one of those different status steps. The basic idea is that we start with pre-planning. The thing to think about with pre-planning is like a draft email. You have it, but you haven't sent it. From your side as a customer, if something's in pre-planning, in theory, GSA is doing nothing because you haven't sent it to us. Once you send us your need, then it will move from pre-planning to unassigned, and then we'll assign a PM. We'll walk through requirements like I talked about already and kind of build and develop what you need and then move it through the system in terms of what GSA needs. You'll add funding and then everything will be signed. Literally all done in the system, even the signature elements. And when we're finished the entire process and have a signature from both you guys, the customer agency and GSA, both done through DocuSign and put back into eReta, we have an accepted RWA, which is an accepted agreement. Work can start. So what is the difference? Not what is the difference? What are our systems? Rita and eReta. It's not two different systems, ironically. So if you hear your GSA counterparts talking about Rita, you say, oh gosh, I'm using eReta. It's the same thing. It's real-time access to the exact same information. The difference is how you log in. Customers log in through our external portal. GSA people log in through the internal PBS portal. It's an acronym within an acronym. It stands for RWA Entry and Tracking Application. But all things RWAs are in there. It has the information that you need to create your work request and your RWAs, and it has the documentation, the scopes, the estimates, the schedules, that stuff's available as well. I encourage you to get access if you don't have it. It's not a very difficult process. It's pretty well mapped out. You can get read-only access based on your agency bureau codes, or you could get data entry access, depending on what your particular needs are. Next slide, please. Okay, I didn't want to touch too much on our systems because as you can see in the bottom right corner, client enrichment series training that is eReta specific is coming up on November 9th. So I encourage you to join that. You'll learn more about the process and the system and how to navigate it. We also every quarter offer some additional RWA training through client enrichment series. So you can check us out on there. Um, we have a wealth of information, gsa.gov slash RWA, and you will find all the things you ever wanted to know about RWAs and how to contact us. Thanks, All Megan. right. Thank you very much for the information on eReta and the shout out to our eReta Digest. Uh, moving into our next section, uh, Kelly Ellison will now detail the release of lease of a leased or owned GSA space. Kelly, you got it. Thanks, Victor. Thank you. So I'm back to talk about release of space. So let's think about it. You've gone from planning your occupancy out and pricing it out, knowing how much you have for to pay for shell and TI items. We have procured your space. You've built it out, you're in the space, maybe you have a 10 year OA term and five years in, you decided to do some uh, remodeling of your space. So you have a mid occupancy alteration and you've used your RWA, maybe you wanna move a wall, change some wallpaper, what have you. But then you decide, you know what, we don't need this space. So what is that next step? Next slide, please. It's time to let your space go. So there are some caveats on when you can do that and how you can do it. So with four months written notice, tenant agencies can release space back to PES, providing obviously you no longer have a requirement for the space. Also that the space is not designated as non cancelable in your OA. I'll touch on that briefly in the next slide. Also, the space has to be in marketable blocks, which I will also explain more. Now in lease space, you have to be in your space for a year, 12 months before you can exercise your four months release of space rights. So you have to be in your space 16 months before you can release space. And in parking spaces, 
And with antennas, you actually don't need to provide notice at all. There is no four month requirement to release space. It can be released immediately. Next slide. So what is non-cancelable space? That is space that has certain criteria and we make that determination at the start of your OA. Agencies can't volunteer to be designated as non-cancelable or have non-cancelable space simply to get a reduced uh, PBS fee. Now, non-cancelable space typically is going to have one or more of the following characteristics. Maybe it's in a remote location, it's not easily accessible. Perhaps there's a special build out, something that is so specialized to the specifications of that particular agency that it's gonna be highly cost prohibitive to retrofit for another agency. All our lease constructions are gonna be non-cancelable. And we also look at maybe there's an unusual term. So really, if there's a lack of realistic federal need other than the requesting agency, all these factors are going to play into whether we make something non-cancelable. Now, when it is designated as non-cancelable, that PBS fee is reduced from seven to 5%. Most commonly, you will find non-cancelable space in uh, LPOEs, land of port entries, uh, as well as airport leases. We see them a lot. What's important to remember is again, that non-cancelable space is looking at any factors that would significantly impair our ability to backfill that space. Next slide. The other thing I wanna point out is that that space has to be marketable to return it to us. And that is when you're looking at the location of the space, the use of the space and the size of the space. So it's considered marketable if it can be assigned to another federal tenant in its current condition or to a private sector tenant, which we call an outlease. Now you can pay to have that space made marketable. Looking at your screen, that green box represents all of an agency space and that orange block is what they want to return. The gray part is the common cor corridor. So as it stands, this orange space is not marketable. Now, if the agency wanted to submit an RWA to have a hallway constructed going to the gray portion, then that space would become marketable and you would be able to release it. So that's the first factor. It has to be accessible to the common corridor. Also, you can't really return really small spaces. For instance, if you had a janitorial closet, you can't just return the closet space. And the space must be continuous. If you had lots of blocks, little blocks all over your space, that would not be considered something that was marketable. Now, what we do request is that if you have a release of space uh, notice, please send it to that e email link uh, that's on as soon as possible. Even if you don't have the exact date to you want that you want to move out, that's okay. The sooner we know, the better that we can start planning. So that's it for the release of space slides. And now I'm going to turn it over to Wilma, who's going to talk about disposal of space. That's a totally separate issue. And it's when the building is totally released from our GSA inventory. So take it away. Thanks so much, um, Kelly. I appreciate it. Um, next slide, please, Victor. As depicted by an earlier slide, we're at the end of the road, or more appropriately, we're at the end of the facility's life cycle. An agency must be a landholding agency to come to us for disposal services. A landholding agency is a federal agency that has custody and accountability for the real property involved in a disposal transaction. Anything the federal government builds and occupies, when there's no longer a need, they come to our office. Our mission is to lead the federal government in optimizing its real property portfolio through effective disposition and utilization strategies. What does that mean exactly? We provide realty services to all landholding agencies to help identify, prepare, and divest of underperforming, underutilized, and unneeded real property in their portfolio. Our responsibility also includes communicating best practices, lessons learned, and updates on statutory and regulatory changes. Next slide, please. Because of our expertise in the disposal of real property, we see all types of properties for every different mission purpose. Properties differ widely in type and value and may include improved and unimproved land, office buildings, warehouses, commercial and industrial facilities, airfields, hangars, lighthouses, former post offices, farms, and single and multifamily residences. Next slide, please. Determining whether or not you're dealing with real property is important because the process by which that property will be managed and disposed of will depend on whether or not it's treated as personal property or real property. In our uh, regulations and our authorizing statute, real property is defined as interest in land, 
and they could be any interest in land, including easement or other types of interest, together with improvements, structures, fixtures that are located on the land under the control of any federal agency. But there are exceptions, at least to our definition of real property, and our ability to have authority to manage it in the disposal process. Our process is limited in that it does not cover public domain lands, lands that have been reserved or dedicated for the national forest or national parks, minerals and lands or portions of lands withdrawn or reserved from the public domain, and crops when they're designated by such an agency for disposition by severance and removal from land. Next slide, please. So real property tends to be immovable. Land, permanent structures, houses, office buildings, anything you can imagine, industrial facilities, it can include other structures or items that are affixed to the property, such as fixtures like a light pole or a signal tower or an antenna. Those can all be treated as part of the real property as long as they continue to be attached to the land. What is not considered real property would be things that are movable, like electronic equipment, desks, mobile homes, um, it, or for example, you may put a mobile home on a foundation and think that it's part of the real property. It could be, but if you were to convey that property with the mobile home still on its foundation, you could treat that mobile home as part of the real property. But if that mobile home could be lifted off the foundation and wheeled off the land, it can be disposed of as personal property rather than real property. There are no hard and fast rules about this. It's very circumstantial. Next slide, please. We have positioned ourselves to be your consultant, partnering with you to help you determine what you need, what you don't need, and develop tailored strategies to help divest of unneeded properties. Our comprehensive services listed here uh, range from evaluating the existing use of a property, along with its potential use and valuation, to marketing and selling real estate. Whether it's completing an entire disposal via the Property Act, partnering, partnering with you to help you complete the report of excess, whether it's increasing your knowledge of individual assets in your portfolio by providing a due diligence review by means of a targeted asset review, which tells us how a property was acquired and when it was acquired, where it's, where, where it's past uses and what encumbrances were over the property, we are here to help consider us your problem solver and also educator. Our real property utilization and disposal workshop is a comprehensive training and development program that is, that is intended to be an interactive resource for federal real property professionals. Next slide, please. So all successful projects begin with a tailored strategy. We deal with the bundle of sticks. Each stick represents a different property right. We just don't manage the building and the dirt, but the entire bundle of sticks. Understand the, uni the unique aspects of the air, water, mineral rights, land, and buildings all have value individually and collectively. All are a part of developing a tailored strategy to achieve whatever outcome either we or the land holding agency is after, as well as the right authority to execute that strategy. Understanding the asset, the due diligence, and the real estate fundamentals of it, gain an understanding of the local markets and the stakeholders, the surrounding uses, area transportation, and what the menu of, menu of options are to include what authority to use is our business. We don't approach projects with a cookie cutter approach. Each project in the Property Act process environs direct engagement with the public. Understanding what the community wants is different in public versus private properties. Our property, properties are publicly owned. Although we have discretion and flexibility, our processes include the expectations of the local communities, um, the authorities and regulations and statutes that require us to engage with public entities early and develop and maintain working relationships throughout the disposal process. So no matter what, uh, whether it be the Property Act, Federal Asset Sales and Transfer Act, or FASTA legislation, National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act, Housing Authority, or many other authorities, we're in the position to help you satisfy your requirements, regardless of the authority. If we're not working via the traditional Property Act funding, we have ways in which we can work with agencies to deliver our services via reimbursable agreements and by supplementing our own expertise with that of industry expertise. With a variety of blanket purchase contracts with some of the nation's largest realty brokers and environmental firms. Next slide, please. Many of you participating today represent land holding agencies and are familiar with and have participated in the process to report excess property for disposition and others have not, but no worries. I'll walk you through a very, very high level uh, overview of the process. 
We're targeting three main audiences as we go through the disposal process. One, federal agencies, two, local and state entities and some nonprofits, and three, the general public in that order. After acceptance of your ROE, the first step in the flow chart is the federal screening and transfer. Basically, we query other federal agencies, land holding agencies, for 30 days to see if there is an expression of interest to acquire or a transfer of custody and accountability. Keeping in mind that the US still holds title because we have not transferred the property out of federal ownership. If a federal agency does not select the property within 30 day timeframe, the property is determined at surplus to the needs of the federal government. Now that the property is surplus, it can be made available to homeless assistance providers, which takes priority over all other public uses, followed by state and local governments and some nonprofit organizations via the next step, public use, public conveyance process, in which an organization can acquire the properties for certain specific purposes by two methods for up to as much as 100% discount of the fair market value in exchange for the entity agreeing that they uh, will continue using the property for one of the uses listed on the slide or by negotiated sale where the public body will pay fair market value for the property without use or time restrictions or compliance inspections. If there's no interest at the second phase from public bodies and nonprofits or no legislation that directs the sale, we move to the last phase where we sell to the general public via sale bid, live auction, or online auction. Next slide. And just a reminder, each of the topics that I presented today can be presented in more detail during our workshops, utilizing project case studies. As listed on the left and the top right of this slide under recorded training, the Office of Real Property Utilization and Disposal has developed several online tools and resources to assist federal agencies in reporting a property access for disposal. Obtaining information on available excess properties that could be utilized by another federal agency and resources to learn about and obtain additional real property asset management services. Also, there are resources listed on this slide in support of release of your GSA management managed space. I appreciate your time today and your attention, and we look forward to partnering with you in the future to support your real property disposal needs. Over to you, Victor. All right, thank you very much, Wilma. Uh, we're sure. nearing the finish line now, folks, so I'm gonna pass it to James Fotopoulos uh, to, uh, so he can return and detail how to ensure you are satisfied with your space throughout the entire process. James? Thanks, Victor. So we have a couple surveys that we use. Now that, now that we're done with uh, the survey or done with the journey, we wanna survey our folks to see, well, how do we do? So we've got two surveys. One is the uh, tenant satisfaction survey. And unfortunately, due to the pandemic, the last uh, TSS, short for uh, tenant satisfaction survey, was conducted in FY19. But once it starts back up, and it will, it will go back to an annual survey. The TSS does show our tenants and does, does allow our tenants to give us feedback on the building's performance, such as opportunities for improvement, measure of satisfaction for all occupants within the facility, and ways that we can improve uh, your, your customers' experience in our building. So this tenant satisfaction survey is on, on hiatus for a little bit, but it will come back. The next survey that we use, just as, um, as we've gone through the, uh, through the roadmap, this survey pulls our customers and, and sees, uh, as we go through the life cycle, how, how have we been doing? So the, the Project Pulse Survey surveys our RWA and leasing projects at the intervals during the project life cycle. So GSA can check in with our customers to see how the expectations are being met. For RWAs, the survey is sent at acceptance, midpoint, and substantial completion. For leases, the survey is sent at the request for lease proposal, lease award, and at least effective. If you receive the survey for your project, please complete it. We appreciate your feedback. And this, uh, this survey is, is very valuable and is something that our leadership looks at. So if you do uh, receive a survey if you, or if you have a cohort that's, that's getting these, maybe you're not the, the PM, but you know the, the surveys do exist, please have them complete those. And that way we can uh, pass along your feedback to our PMs, our leasing specialists, and so on and so forth. Really appreciate your feedback. So what are some tools that uh, we can uh, that our um, 
our folks on the phone can use as far as managing your, your business with the public building service. Our next section will focus on the PBS customer dashboard. It's a great tool for agencies to help manage their portfolio. Our speaker today will be Jennifer Feliciano, National Customer Analyst, and under the uh, customer engagement folks in our central office. Jennifer spent 15 years performing federal real estate duties in Region 8 and has recently joined the Office of Portfolio Management and Customer Engagement last summer. So she is very new to our group. Jennifer, take it away. All right. Thanks, James. Okay, so to help you manage your agency's portfolio, we've created this customer dashboard. The dashboard allows you 24-7 access to your PBS managed projects and occupancy data. Other benefits of the dashboard is that it, the information is updated daily. It's a self-service access to the data, which includes project information, reports, and trends. There's also reduced manual reporting burden um, by having the raw data at your fingertips that can be downloaded and used for your own agency's purposes. It's a one-stop shop to, to view multiple data sources such as eReta, Rent on the Web, and PBS inventory systems. And then it also provides additional security by using the OMB max.gov registration that provides PIV card access as well as verifying the user's credentials. And to the right of your screen, you'll see a snapshot of the dashboard homepage. Next slide. All right, one sec, flips there. Um, so the dashboard can help you, next slide. Okay, thank you. Um, the dashboard can help you answer specific questions about your portfolio through the use of five dashboard modules. There's the My Projects tab, My RWAs, My Occupancies, My Locations, and My Rent. The dashboard can answer many questions, questions such as how am I spending my design money versus the move cost for the project? What dollar amounts have been authorized, obligated, or what are remaining on the RWA? Or maybe you just wanna know how much space do you occupy in a certain city? Um, you can also find out what your space type breakout is for an actual occupancy agreement, as well as um, why your rent bill may have changed month to month and why. These are just a few of the questions that can be answered within the dashboard. Next slide. Within the five tabs, you will have a general layout that allows you to filter information based on what you're looking for. There is also a high level summary section that provides useful overview based on that search. Next, you can view your data in a statistics section that provides you handy maps, tables, and charts. And then lastly, you can dive even further into the details of that individual item. As mentioned, all this information can be downloaded um, for your own agency's use. But also note that the tool provides the detailed data, but it won't actually um, provide you the actual documents such as RWA documents or OA agreements. These documents we found using the other tools that have been mentioned throughout the presentation, such as um, eReta, um, EOA tool. All right, next slide. So here is just a view of what you would see when you go into the dashboard. This is on the My Projects. Um, it's just showing you the filter section, all the different ways you can filter the information. Also keep in mind that you will only be able to see your agency specific data for security purposes. Um, and then below is the National Project Summary section. Um, there you'll see kind of how many projects your agency has um, based on uh, project type. Next slide. And the next slide, you'll see the RWA tab. And again, this is just kind of showing you the national summary of the RWAs that you have by type, um, showing you how much might be authorized or obligated. Um, and then down below is an actual list of the detailed RWAs that you might have. Um, and then from there, you can drill down even further to get information such as um, detailed scope, who's your project manager, et cetera. Next slide. In the Occupancy Agreements tab, you will also find graphics such as this map of where your OAs are located. The graphic's not static, so you'll be able to zoom in and out. You also see that the, the map label dots change in size based on your agency's portfolio footprint at those locations. And then in the bottom section, um, you'll be able to view and export a list of all your agency occupancy agreements. And if you dive in even further, you might be able to find, you will be able to find um, the 12 month planning milestones like Tasneem mentioned for planning. Next slide. This is just a view of um, on the locations tab where you can actually drill down into your individual building and you can find multiple details such as building address, facilities manager, um, historic status. Next slide. And then this is kind of the last section, the rent tab where you can pull numerous rent views based on what you need. So you can do the rent comparison tool to view your rent by month or by year. You can also see how much you're spending maybe in office space or joint use space and parking. 
And again, these are just some of the highlights from the dashboard. Um, so let's figure out how you can actually access this tool. In order to access, I've highlighted three steps for you. First, you will have to register with the max.gov website. Once you have this access, you would also have to register with a D2D website, which is where the customer dashboard is actually housed. Once you have access to both systems, you will need to email your agency's designated approver to gain access. And if you don't know who your approver is, um, you can just email the PBS dashboard mailbox and we will forward the request to your appropriate approver. And then also note that once you do have access, you will um, have to keep it active every 90 days. Otherwise you'll have to re-register again. So I know I went through that really fast. It was kind of the Cliff Notes version of what the dashboard can provide, um, but you will see here on the next slide um, that we have some additional resources such as the user guide. Um, there's also some additional trainings that we'll dive into um, how to actually navigate and use the tool. So, and that's it. Victor, I'll turn it back to you to wrap things up. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, I just wanna say um, thank you to our entire slew of incredible presenters for a great presentation. Uh, and I'd also like to thank all of you in the audience, our clients who are able to join us. We covered a vast amount of information here and we are very pleased to have seen so many of you stick through it. We hope you enjoyed and found this presentation useful. Uh, just as uh, behind the scenes, we hope to use today's presentation as a jumping off point to refine future introduction to GSA presentations. As you can see, this one literally took us to the buzzer. <laughs> um, so thank you for being a part of this first iteration. We will post uh, formal written responses to the questions and comments posted in the Q&A panel as a frequently asked questions document because we do not have the time to answer them today. Um, for and for reference, that will be on the website www.gsa.gov slash CES. Um, in terms of our upcoming client enrichment series sessions for November 2021, uh, they will include our monthly e-reader digest presentation on November 9th, which was shouted out earlier, uh, as well as our federal solutions to co-working on November 18th. To learn more about either of these presentations uh, on our website, visit www.gsa.gov slash PBS forums and tell a friend to come and check it out. Um, to learn more about the client enrichment series as a whole, sign up at www.gsa.gov slash CES. Uh, the goal of the client enrichment series is to engage our audiences in workplace topics that contribute to your mission success and to your effective management of your real estate and workplace programs. Thank you again so much for attending and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.